Okay, so welcome everybody to Chevalier's Books Online. We are the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles, established in 1940. Tonight, we have two very special guests with us to celebrate the publication of this memoir, All Is Not Lost. First, we have with us actor, director, and screenwriter, Nestor Carbonell. I'm sure many of you already know him from his beloved roles in uh, productions such as Bates Motel, The Dark Knights, and of course, Lost. But Nestor's main role tonight will be to interrogate our main star and featured author, Shannon Kenny Carbonell. Shannon grew up in Sydney, Australia before moving to the US at age 18 and earning a BFA in theater from Cal Arts. She has since enjoyed a career working in regional theater before transitioning to television guest star roles. Some of her favorites include being on HBO's Dream On, NBC's Seinfeld, and of course, Muscle, where she first met Nestor. All Is Not Lost is her first book and hopefully not her last. So thank you both so much for being here and sharing this story with us. Without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand over the stage to our wonderful speakers. So Nestor and Shannon, if you two would please take it away. You wanna say- Hi everyone, thank you for coming, first of all. So appreciate that. Yeah, and thank mm -hmm. you, Teresa, for, for hosting this, you know, Chevaliers. Bookstore has been, it uh, holds a special place in our heart because we used to take our kids there when they were really little. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so and, and it is one of the oldest, uh, it is the oldest independent bookstore in LA. So we're thrilled that, that people are, are supporting Chevaliers, uh, those who've come tonight and, and obviously everyone who frequents Chevaliers. So thank you for that. And the new space is amazing. It just seems to hold a lot more books to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's incredible. Um, good job. Beautiful job. So yeah, I uh, so why don't we, you know, so for everyone, thank you guys all for joining us tonight. So why don't we, before we dive in, I thought it would be really great if you could read a few pages for everybody so they could hear your voice, even though they can imagine your voices, those who know you as, as you read it. But maybe it, it'd be nice just for, for those who don't know much about the book, for you to just give people a sense of, you know, of what the book is about and sort of in, just in reading it. Or no, just right now, just in general, just let people know what, what the oh, book is, yeah. Just to talk about it yeah, first? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so um, the book is about really the journey I took. Uh, I, okay, I'm gonna give you the elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know whether to look at you or- It doesn't matter. I, I don't think, I don't a, I don't I think you can be wrong. Okay, I'm gonna look at you in the screen and Teresa. Okay, so the book is about, <laughs> The book is about what happened after I uh, left my career, which was really my dream, um, and decided to become a full-time mom to my two boys. And what happened almost immediately afterwards was that I had a huge sort of vacant hole in my chest or within me. And it was, it was really what happened when I, my ego and my ambition I sort of went to war with that almost immediately after leaving acting and because that still remained and it was shocking. And then I, I, I very quickly lost my self identity, my identity. It was very tied up in being an actress. And it's sort of about the journey I had to take to, to sort of reconcile with all of that. But it mainly takes place my story when we moved to Hawaii uh, for a year while well, Nestor shot his final season on Lost, which was the final season of Lost. And the journey I took in Hawaii, which was really important because it was sort of a big bump away from Hollywood. And it was a year where I was able to sort of look back on my whole life in Hollywood, especially after moving from the age of 18, firstly to go to theater school and then into Hollywood. And to kind of piece together the parts of myself that I needed to be in order to be whole again without that label I had given myself for so long and worked for for so long and all, all the things I needed, um, sort of the puzzle that needed to fulfill myself on the inside. And it's something about Hawaii and it was this huge journey I took there and the people I met and the land and and just, I think it was a stepping back that allowed me to, in this year, really find myself on a journey back home. Um, 
to kind of who I would have been or who I really was behind all that ambition that I had really had since I was about nine. And that's the book. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, um, so why don't we dive in? Why don't, if you would read the preface, so people get a tease. The preface obviously teases an event in, while we were living in Hawaii that year. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you give that a read? This is the prologue, and the um, book sort of takes place in um, in sort of like a, a a journal form, but it's not a journal. It's a story. Um, but the prologue takes place in January 2010. I've actually never read from the book out loud, so here we go. I can't do the red carpet with you, I whispered to Nestor once we'd settled into the town car and just, oh, I feel fat and ugly. I don't wanna be photographed. You look beautiful, he said a little too loudly. Shh, please, I begged. I didn't want the driver to hear us. And then the tears came. I tilted my head back and breathed deeply, hoping to stem the tide. My fake lashes had taken so damn long to apply, I couldn't risk ruining them. Nestor did as I asked. He let it go. I kept my head back just in case. I'm sorry, I whispered. He shrugged. It's not a big deal. I, I don't care about any of this stuff. It was true. He didn't care about attention from the press or the public's perception of him. Walking the red carpet for the premiere episode of the final season of Lost was merely a part of his job, but I knew he'd be happier with me by his side while he courted his fans and the media. The problem was I did care about all of that stuff. All my life I'd wanted to be a famous actress, not just an actress. I'd always been desperate to be seen, to be known, yet now I didn't want anyone to recognize me to survey what I'd become, an actress who'd given up on her career and also on maintaining her size six body. But how can an invisible person be famous? Fame only exists quantitatively. There's a star and there's a star as many fans. That's all there is to it. And no matter how shallow the equation of fame proved to be, I'd programmed myself to want it. So now I had a big problem. If I was noticed, Noticed by large numbers of people, I existed. If I was not, hiding wasn't simply hiding. Hiding was wiping out the equation. Hiding was erasing myself. I apologized to Nestor again. He told me not to sweat it again. Once we stepped out of the car, the crowd of onlookers began calling his name, each voice begging him to come and talk. Photographers surrounded him, the cacophony of calls, camera clicks and the baseline buzz of chatter jolted me out of my ruminative stupor as we stepped out of the sealed and quiet of our car, as did the shouts rising above the slushing and breaking of the expansive Waikiki shore. I watched Nestor pleasing both fans and the media as he moved down the red carpet. Then I lost sight of him in the press of the crowd in the bleached fog of sea spray, sand dust and camera flashes. He'd entered the land of flawless men and women spun into gods and goddesses, and I was stranded, left behind, a mortal who was forever barred from that kingdom. I snuck away into the little tent area to wait with the other partners who didn't want to walk the red carpet. We made small talk for a while, until suddenly the crowd gave a huge roar. I looked out from under the tent. A famous actress had arrived, Evangeline Lilly, Evie as the cast called her. She played Kate, the female lead. I thought she was excellent in her role, but I had no idea who she really was as a person. Nestor rarely worked on set with her and she mistakenly called him Chester. He didn't have the heart to correct her the first time, so he let it go until it had reached the point of no return. She looked just like I'd always wanted to look, petite and soft. Her skin was flushed and glistened as she beamed at the crowd and the press. She smiled with her eyes, they twinkled, and danced about as she moved through the crowd. When she lifted her slender, perfectly sculpted arm and waved, I could feel the sweat dripping down my own inner arm flap and my back fat minimizing bra. If she had an outside, I'd be glad to share it with the world. She had what I wanted. When the fans looked at her, they probably felt like they knew her. What they saw was a happy, sweet, effortless beauty who'd been blessed with talent 
and deserved great fortune. She was entrancing. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. I sighed deeply, seeing her just as the crowd did. I wanted to be her. I wanted all that adoration and that unconditional love heaped upon me by strangers. I knew I had big love, true love, real love, right in front of me three times over. One husband and two little boys. But the number felt too small. I craved quantity, not quality. Three was not thousands. Three was not millions. The reality is no young woman goes to Hollywood with the dream of becoming a wife and a mom. I failed. And so I wanted to be erased. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, babe. <laughs> uh, no. uh, you made me want to cry. <laughs> no. Um, you know, I, there's a few things I just got from that. Because the well, it just comes you back. Are enough. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I, I know, no, I know all that, and and we'll talk about that because that, that all of that is encap encapsulates why you wrote the book. One thing I thought I had was like, you got to do an audio book. I mean, that was just amazing. <laughs> I mean, well, I, you know, I was reading it today. I was practicing it um, with uh, Marco, our youngest, was sitting with me. He's like 15, 16, almost sixteen, and. Uh, are you saying to him, you know, I, I got over that. I got over that. <laughs> I was like, mom's over. over that. Don't worry. You're enough. You're really enough. <laughs> oh, you had, you had to reassure him. I know. And then he said to me something really weird, like, um, oh, then he goes, uh, are most boys not circumcised? What? I'm like, oh, okay. my God, okay. you've been listening to me? Uh, <laughs> complete non sequitur. Uh, <laughs> that's, there you go. But he wasn't listening to me, anyway. so don't worry. Um, <laughs> But I mean, I, I have just some questions just based on that because it, it kind of encapsulates exactly what the book is about. And you share so much, as people can see, you're so raw, you're so honest, you give, you, you dare to go to the deepest, deepest, darkest places of what you're feeling and revealing that to the world, which a lot of people wouldn't. So I wanna know what, why, did, why did you feel uh, the need to, to share this, so pain, this painful journey of yours? Well, I didn't, I mean, I did feel the need to share the journey only because I kind of knew a lot of people were going through it. I knew that when I talked to my friends about writing the story, they all said, you have to write this because we talk about this every single day. You have to write about this. I mean, I mean, I know that people have written stories like this before, but I knew that this was something that everybody talked about this this losing this part of yourself some people um a friend of mine the other day called it you're in servitude to your kids um i also knew that it's a little bit taboo that we're not meant to say this about kind of this loss of self because we're meant to be so grateful for our kids which we are of course but you do and when you quit your career and usually a lot of people have worked a lot of years gone to school. I mean, I have a really, really good friend who had gone to medical school and, and I don't know if she's there right now out there listening, but she, she's a neurologist. She quit her job to raise three children. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of women do it, but then they don't talk about what they lose when they do that. And um, so I, I knew this story would relate to a lot of people. So that's why I felt okay telling it. And I really made sure that I wanted this book like to be like I was talking to a friend and not just telling this narcissistic tale just about myself. And the reason I could, I mean, now that I see it and read it, sometimes I think, oh yeah, I am really going pretty uh, raw here. Um, and that was just because I had to find a true voice. I knew if I, when I was doing rewrite after rewrite, and there were a ton of rewrites, because, you know, this is my first book. Um, it was just, I would read it and go, no, you're lying. You're lying there. What did you really feel? And then, and the deeper I got, the more I knew that was my voice. It's just like being an actor when you, you find a character and it, it takes a while sometimes to sink into that character's voice. And so I knew that feeling of knowing the character. So I knew this, the same feeling of knowing when my voice was true in the book. And that just meant telling the exact truth. 
it's, it's, you're, I mean, you did, you certainly found your voice and it's extremely raw and honest and everything you're hearing from everybody is like, oh my God, you, you really are bearing your soul, which is great. And I think one of the interesting things you talked about sort of the taboo nature of the topic, which I think is, is really worth talking about because on the one hand, you're right. You're talking about how it is relatable to a lot of moms. We're talking about this issue. Like, I got it. Like nobody warns you. They, they warn you about the sleep deprivation. They warn you about like how mind numbingly boring it can be to play with a child with a Lego for like five hours. Nobody warns you about losing your identity when it's so tied to what you're doing before you had kids. Nope. So the other partner gets to go and do that and have the kid. But the one who gives up mother, you know, the career for motherhood is they don't warn you about this loss of this shift. Okay. And, and yet you're talking about how you're meant to be eternally grateful for what you are. And, and did you talk about in the book about, about the, the shame, you know, that, that yeah. you felt? Yeah. Constantly. Because I did feel guilty. I felt, you know, first of all, being a staying at home mom is such a privilege. And I knew that. I knew that, I mean, we had to give up a lot of stuff, right? Because, um, we had to pay for private school. We happened to live in a district, you know, especially for high school where um, it was pretty gang uh, affiliated. The school we would have to go to, the kids would have to go through metal detectors and stuff like that. So we really, we made a decision to go to private school. So we gave up a lot of stuff. We never, you know, we, we, we had to give up a lot of stuff for me to stay home. So, but I know people don't have that choice. I know a lot of, moms have to work so I knew that was a big gift I'd been given and yet I felt like I was looking you know the gift horse in the mouth is that how it goes yeah I never did lose yeah, that's yeah. right <laughs> I love um, it when you use idioms I yeah. do use idioms really bad no you don't it's, it's fun it's always fun <laughs> so um um so I knew that so I felt the whole time I felt guilty I also felt guilty because a lot of my friends weren't having babies that easily you know they were going through in vitro and and some of them were getting surrogates and so I was really lucky in that way too but I mean I'm also very honest I don't I mean another another the, my very friend who was going through in vitro she once said to me and she says it all the time and she's a nurse and she's a nurse that never wants her patients to suffer pain and she said to me um pain is relative it's relative and pain is pain. And so while knowing it is relative and I know that my pain is nothing like a lot of people's pain, it's very small in comparison. I think in the way that a lot of our pain is small in comparison to living in a different country, right? We're not in Africa. Uh, we, we are very lucky to be Americans, um, blah, blah, blah. But, 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 it was pain, it was really deep seated pain that I needed to get um, on the other side of in order to be a better mom. And, and one that you weren't prepared for, you, you it, knew it. Oh my right. gosh, it was a shock to my system. Right. And I didn't even really verbalize it very often except to you. Yes, and you, but you, and you remember you would tell me that intellectually you understood, oh my God, I'm so lucky. Yeah. Oh my God, I have two kids. I, you know. We got, we have two kids. Oh my God, I don't have to hold two or three jobs like a lot of moms do. You knew it intellectually, but emotionally, I remember you telling me you felt like you were in quicksand. You're like, I don't know why. And then that got, and then you were depressed and you didn't know why. And then, and then you remember you telling me that you're like, and then you felt like you couldn't be a good enough mom. So that depressed you. And then it only fed on itself. Yeah. So now you're an emotional quicksand with this depression about not knowing what to do with this identity not feeling like you're a good enough mom and then this thing just snowballs and i'm also a depressive and the, the and i really worked on that really worked on that and, and come out the other end but if a depressive gets depressed <laughs> it's like that's very frightening because yeah, it's like i've been there and i can't go there if i have kids i mean i just feel like that was scary i felt like oh i could that's not good if I go back to that place and I have kids, I don't want to leave them. That was very scary. Yeah. And then I owe them. I owe these kids, a mom, and I owe them. I owe them everything, you know. So that was another place that I could not go to. I had to figure this out. Yeah. I had to figure it out. And yet, you owe that nine-year-old girl that you talked about before that you made a vow to say, 
what was it about? It's embarrassing. Yeah, but that's just it's in the book. I hate saying it out loud. No. Oh, I, I made myself a vow when I was nine and it was um <laughs> Shannon Kenny will be a famous actress. Yeah. <laughs> and I sort of brainwashed myself almost into really wanting that. And thank God I I went to theater school and I learned how to become an actress, but I really wanted to be a famous actress. I really wanted that. And uh, at a really early age. At a very early age, and it didn't end. And it was a driving force for me. And it's a really dangerous, and again, I didn't tell anybody else about that. And it was a very, it's a very dangerous position to put yourself in. And, um, sorry, that's my phone. I got to touch this one. Um, and, um, it's a very dangerous, nobody should do that. And I had to almost deprogram myself out of my own cult. And, and um, that took a lot of work. And so I was, yeah, I was really fighting with that little nine-year-old girl inside me. Right, <laughs> that little nine-year-old. And that little nine-year-old, that's what I'm saying is you, you, you weren't able to give the nine-year-old what you promised her. No. And you gave it up for the boys. Yep. Which is why it's so heartbreaking, you know, yeah. so much of it, you know. Yeah. Your journey, and which is, we talked about that as you're going through it. And, and that is why so many other moms relate to this because they, they too, you know, and, and, all, and, and, and fathers who, who have given up their careers, yeah. their stay at home dads too, who have given up on a dream uh, that fulfilled them in some way. Yes. to do something incredibly valuable raising two kids and you know it at the time but that sense of self and that that yeah. pride you had and that promise to yourself that little nine-year-old you can't keep because now you got to promise it to these two little boys yeah yes that but also i knew that that was a that's a very superficial thing i i i promised myself too but, but okay, let's talk about that because you, it, initially you felt it was a famous actress was important, but then you made a shift. Um, and, and tell people what happened when you were seventeen. You know, you you applied to to college. Oh, when I was seventeen, I well, when I was seventeen, I got on a soap opera in right. Australia. But then I worked a year, saved up all my money, and I wanted to go to theater school. So I applied um, to a theater school in LA and I got into Cal Arts. I then later applied to Juilliard. Did you but I forward? had no yeah. money. I'll get, I'll get the phone. Sorry. I'll get the phone. Sorry guys. <laughs> they have this really annoying Sherwood Forest. <laughs> it really is uh, annoying. Um so um so this is the great thing that along the line I, I learned how to become a good actress, but I didn't let go of wanting to be a famous actress. Right, but you learned, you learned to appreciate the craft. Oh, I did, and I loved it. I yeah. loved acting. I yeah. loved it. So it was giving up a love, and but it was also giving up, um, like uh, like I say in the in the first chapter, it was giving up this thing that I needed to be seen. I really felt like, without being an actress, I was nobody. It was very strange. It was very strange to feel that at a mature age when I knew that that was dumb. So I felt like a, I, I felt like an idiot, actually. I felt like a fool. And so I wasn't going to really tell anybody about that except Nestor. Yeah. <laughs> but, I knew he'd still love me. No, I know. But, but here's the interesting thing. I think, and I think that's why I think people can relate to it. Not strictly because, you know, not everybody obviously aspires to be an actor, but everyone wants to be relevant in some fashion right. everybody wants to mean something to someone you know whether it's at you know at your, your, at your business that you run whether it's you know at, at the parish whether it's a community activity that you do you know whatever it is you do that fill you know fills you because you are something to someone yeah and it may not be thousands or millions it may be three it may be 20 it may be you know whatever that number is you still mean something and that means something to you because you have a purpose and we all strive for purpose and while you had incredible purpose with, with, you know, raising two boys, you lost the purpose outside of that. And you, yeah. ne and you never buried it. And no one told you that you had to. Yeah. And I think that's why Hawaii was really special because I came to Hawaii as Nestor's wife and the boy's mom. And I realized there, because I made so many friends, 
and it was so easy and even strangers were I don't know there was something about my interaction with strangers and they almost like I was it was almost like I was a survivor on the <laughs> island it really was like every little bit of interaction began to teach me something the way people I don't want to spoil the book but there's a section in I think there's a whole chapter about the lady I met at Long's drugstore. Oh yes, great job. And and it was the way she interacted with me, and and it it was amazing. She gave she phone she called me. Okay, don't give it away. I won't tell it. Right, but, okay. but this phone call she gave me, and and that it was it, like I didn't know her, and it happened all the time with strangers, yeah. and and they all started to see me just as me. I mean, it's so narcissistic to say that. They taught me that I wasn't, I didn't need all that stuff. That you were enough. Yeah, and it, and but it wasn't just that the, they were seeing me as me, I was seeing them and and thinking, of course, that's what you just, that Patty's got it, Patty has it right. Patty at she, know, yeah. she knows the deal. Why, why am I not seeing that? You know, what have I missed along the way? How have I, sort of stopped my growth along the way thinking that this is so important when look at this woman shining from the inside and and I needed to see a lot of that and 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 I don't think I was like brushing off people who weren't famous or anything not at all but I just sort of needed to understand it at a really visceral level or something like that you talk also about the land something about Hawaii oh yeah so what is it you mentioned the book. Is it that people are drawn? It draws people that are interesting, or that, 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 you talk about that. <laughs> I don't know. Is that is getting into lost territory? Because <laughs> you uh, do a lot of parallels with the I show. I do. I do. Because I was really, you know, I I met the I met so many good friends, and I talk about them in the book. And uh, I really was sort of planning on this really solitary year of just sort of thinking, what? Okay, just let's just figure this out. Figure out a new identity. Why am I so caught up in this? And and I thought, I'll just sit down and think about all this. And I don't, I don't need to make friends. I have the best friends in LA. And all of a sudden, I just met all these great women. And uh, and they were very easy to know. And towards the end of it, I, I was thinking, now, do they get this personality from this the land that is really powerful and very earthy? It almost just has a magnet to it. Like, you feel like you're pulled down. I don't know if that has anything to do with volcanic energy, because Hawaii was made from of volcanoes um, or the or the the long the the, the local people the the, the history the people, yeah, yeah um, the indigenous people have a lot of very um, strong spiritual ties to their land um, sort of like the aboriginals in Australia too it's all to do with the land and so I was wondering it is, is does that weigh them down and make them this way or do they all get drawn to Hawaii because they are this way and so I sort of pondered that question. I don't know. Yeah. But the land is very important there. There is something. And if you just give yourself over to that place, I mean, there's also the, just the beautiful visual beauty of it all. But there's more. You can really feel it. And a lot of people don't want to leave Hawaii. A lot of the cast members are still there. No, you wanted me to be a, after the show. I wanted, I wanted him to try and get on Hawaii Five O. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I, oh, I did ask. I, I called my agent. I was like, I no. made him call his manager and his agent. I was like, no, Daniel Lee Kim is on. They yeah. have two lost <laughs> actors on the show. I was like, all right, next time. All right. I could still go back and look at my friend. I really would. Is that show still on? Is it still on? And why thought I always think it's still on. It's still on? Okay. It's really... Anyway, so, but let, let's, I want to go back a little bit and talk about the sacrifices you made so people can have some context to, to see how deep this passion of yours before you that you gave up for for motherhood how deep it was like what what you had to do to, because you didn't have much much money you didn't have any resources to come from australia uh, and apply to school here so how did you pay for it how did you manage and and even after that when you started acting how did you do all that well i in order to be a foreign student you have to come up with the first year of money yourself so that's where the soap opera came in handy but the Australian dollar was really bad at the time. I think it was 66 cents or something. So I lost a ton of money in the exchanges. Um, 
So I just had to do really well at school to- You had to be number one in your class. Yeah. I had to, yes, I had to do really well. And I'll do the bragging. No. All right, Shannon had to be number one in her class. She, you paid for the first entire year from the money you made in the soap opera. All the money you did waitressing and clubs and bars would go to you know, your food, your food plan and sedentals. And then you had to be number one in your acting class uh, to, to get the scholarship every year subsequently after that. You didn't have money to fly back for Christmas to to uh, to Australia. The first year, yeah, my so, mom. Yeah, my mom just cried all Christmas Day. So yeah. they made sure I got back. Oh, I know, I, I know. Nice. But it just so people have some context of how deep this dream was, and dream was, and how yeah. and the lengths you went to to achieve it. And then, I mean, I remember you telling me that you would go to Sizzler and you couldn't eat anything, you know, with your friends because you didn't have any money for Sizzler. It was Denny's. Or is it Denny's? I can't remember. But you would eat it. You would eat toast. You could eat the toast, and well, that was in the cafeteria. So what? You didn't. You weren't in the meal plan. So well, yeah, I didn't even really know about meal plans, and right. now we do because our son is on one. But <laughs> I guess all my friends were on the cafeteria meal plan, but I could never be on that. So um, I would just go with them, and I'd get water, and um, I would get a paper toast, which was like eighty cents. Yeah. And then um, I could go through this. I could walk around the salad bar. And just snag a few potatoes. Wow. I mean, not potatoes, tomatoes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And pop them on my toast and get some, you know, the, the little butter things. And I just have tomatoes on toast. Right. So I could sit there in the cafeteria with my friends. There like, you go. That's easy. It, well, it was. And it, and you <laughs> wanted it so much that, 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 I mean, these are the things that you would do that a lot of people, you know, I'm not, I mean, yeah, they don't, they don't think about the sacrifices some people make. You know, and, and even after that, when you graduated, yeah. you'd gotten into Juilliard, you couldn't afford to go to Juilliard. Um, it was, that was too expensive. But after you graduated, how many jobs, what kind of jobs did you do before you started acting? Oh, I had, well, I've had 25 waitressing jobs. Wow. And then I cleaned houses and I was a clown <laughs> at birthday parties, which didn't last long because I was so bad at that, oh, so bad. Uh, you Minnie Mouse? I was Minnie Mouse. Mouse. And yeah. then I had no idea. I didn't know how expensive LA was even because it was uh, my first year down. Yeah. Because CalArts is up in Valencia. And we only had the Gregory's. No, it's not called the, the Gregory's. Thomas Guy. The Thomas Guy. It's called the Gregory's in Australia. And uh, so I thought, like, uh, you know, the street, some streets go forever in LA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. I would think that I thought the party was only 20 minutes away because it was on Washington or something. I thought, oh, Washington's down there. No, but this was like an hour into Washington. <laughs> oh, I felt so bad. So I was so late for this little girl's birthday party and my car had no gas gauge. So I sputtered out of fuel and then I <laughs> had to walk to, I mean, it was terrible. I wrecked this whole birthday party for this Minnie Mouse and they were so mad at me that the, the dad was refusing to pay me, which I didn't even blame him. So I actually ended up paying. I I had to pay for be, doing that job. And um, <laughs> so the whole time, just to sort of get out of the awkwardness, I just spoke in my Minnie Mouse voice in, with, with a big thing. You never broke character. I was like, oh, Minnie Mouse is so sorry. Yes, she knows she was bad. <laughs> Minnie Mouse will not require an agreement for this party. Minnie Mouse has wrecked the party. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can you be awful. Minnie Mouse all day? You know, um, oh, and they had Minnie Mouse like plaques up, and um, oh, and all the kids were so tired. But oh, it was awful. Oh man, you that was it. I, I. Yeah, I stopped being a clown. Don't worry, I, I was Batman one I day, <laughs> and I wrecked it. I wrecked that Batman. Yeah. I, they, they made fun of my utility belt. It's not a utility, but anyway. Yeah. yeah, enough about that. But let's. Waitressing was more up my alley. So yeah, yeah but. And you were okay. You were pretty good at that, but you weren't so good at cappuccinos. Oh yes, I got fired once for making flat cappuccinos. I did. I, you know, I had. I knew I would get performance anxiety. I still do. You know, reading this or some auditions, and I had I, the worst performance anxiety I've ever had was making cappuccinos. And then, the, and then the the owner of the restaurant. It was a new restaurant, and I was really rooting for him too. Like I'd almost stand outside and try to get people to come in. And, but all he did was stand over me and watch me make cappuccinos. And then they always went flat. So he fired me. Wow. So. That, sounds, that sounds, <laughs> sounds like a Seinfeld episode. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I, I do want to talk about that because you talk about it in the book is, is you worked, when you say it's interesting that you failed, you know, in the book, 
what you're talking really about is you failed in the terms of a promise you made to that nine-year-old girl. I did. You know, you ne- you didn't fail on on any level. In 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 you know, and you know, if you look at it objectively, my God, you worked for 20 years as an actress, yeah. which in and of itself is an enormous feat. You've raised two young boys. Yeah. I mean, obviously you didn't. I, yeah, I've but, come out on the other end. No, you, there's no, yeah, and you have, and it and it took this journey. Obviously, the book is the journey of that. But tell you talk you talk about uh, uh, you know you, you've worked with so many incredible people. But tell us about the joy of being on set. What 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 did you give up that you miss so much? You know, and you talk about it in the book a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot of things I gave up about acting that I don't miss, like auditioning. Oh, I really didn't miss that. Um, and you know, some diva actors, but not many. And I, I really love actors. And I, there's one thing that, and this is where there's a lot about envy with you in the, in the book. In the book, you talk about it. Look, yeah. And it wasn't envy of your fame or any of that. I mean, it really wasn't it, because whenever you got a job, I was like, yeah, oh, no. yeah, trust me, we needed the money and all that stuff. It was envy of you when you came back from a set. I know. And I know that feeling of being on a set and. Well, explain to people who haven't been on sets yeah, what that's like. Well, first of all, there's the actual, and you and I both agreed, action to cut is the best time for an actor. And. There's something about when everything is working well and you get these moments with an actor or many scene partners and and it all just sort of flies and everyone's getting it and everybody's bouncing off of each other. And that's really, that's that's when you know it's gonna be really watchable and the audience is gonna like go with you and you service the script. If you've really told, because we're, we're really, actors are very, we are interpretive artists. We we interpret somebody else's story. And I always felt like that was um, our job. Like we're a cog in a, a, a really big wheel as actors. And so our job is to service the writer. And it's a really great feeling when you've done that well. And you know that you've made their story better and, and, you've, and you've made it fly somehow. You know, you've given it wings. And when you do that, it's a great feeling. But there's so that's one part of it. But there's another part of like just sitting around sets, you know, where you're waiting for them to light or set things up, or in a play where you're waiting for your entrances, or they're, you know, you know, you're backstage and somebody else is rehearsing, blah, blah, blah. And you just sit with actors and they're really actors are merry. You know, it <laughs> sounds really they're very merry people. And there's you know to go into this business you kind of have to be and they love telling stories and they're kind of a little juvenile and they're funny and I miss that I miss being and they're very open so they'll tell the greatest stories and and they're very willing to listen and some actors some (laughs) (laughs) but um that they really I just miss them I miss them because it's very it, and to commit your, your life to it, it's a really kind of, you got to be brave. And um, crazy. And crazy. Yeah. So there's this, also this, it's, it's a lot of the journeyman actors too. It's yeah. a lot of the actors that are just doing it and getting the jobs and yeah. going from theater to, to television, back to maybe a small part in a film, blah, blah. Those actors are so brave. And you, they tell stories and you laugh and I miss that. I really miss that camaraderie. Yeah. And then I and, and, and you, I yeah. I would always ask you about it. You did, you did. I know. I remember because you almost. I felt like you would live vicariously through what I was going through on set. Even now, you still I like, do. You still ask me like, "Hey, what's it like? On, you know, how was the morning show? I was, you know, what we did talk about it. And I know, I know what you're. I know that feeling when when you want to hear sort of like the fun stuff in between yeah, the takes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so who did you talk to today? Yeah. Um, what are they saying? Did you have a good chat? You know? Yeah, did you have a chat? Who did you chat with? Yeah. I miss that. Well, and you worked with, I mean, incredible talents, you know, incredible actors, you know, uh, James Garner, you, you did a whole film <laughs> with. Too. Incredible. Linda Fiorentino, you did another film mm-hmm. with. Randy Quaid. Um, Sam Shepard, uh, for those, I mean, you know, the few who don't know Sam Shepard, he's, he's obviously an incredible actor, writer, but also an incredible, one of the best contemporary, you know, he's not with us anymore, uh, playwrights, certainly of our time. Um, and you talk about set moments. You had a, an interesting set moment with him at the makeup chair. That, that, you know, you have a fun story. <laughs> you got to tell the story. 
It's not very PG, but <laughs> it's funny. No, not oh, like okay. that. Okay, I'll tell it really quickly. Yeah. Oh, I love Sam Shepard. Okay, so he's he was I was doing a, a movie with him in LA, and um, oh, Purgatory. Yeah, yeah, it was like a western. And anyway, I was sitting in the trailer with him. We we're both getting made up in the makeup trailer, and he was doing a series of he was reading short stories by Chekhov at the, the oh, Geffen, the the Geffen, Geffen, the Geffen Theatre Playhouse yeah. in Westwood. And he was going, oh, it's like, he's really kind of, oh, I gotta do, gotta go do this. Uh, I don't know how to do him, yeah. but I gotta do this, uh, these, read these, these short Chekhov stories at, uh, at the Geffen and I don't know how to get there. And I was like, oh yeah, I know where the Geffen is. And he's like, oh yeah, how do I get there? How do I get there? And I said, okay, so it's on, um, it's in Westwood. And it's on, and I then I blanked on the street, and I said to him, "Oh my God, I can't remember the street, but I know it in my head." And I said to him, "Oh, I can't think of it, but it, it's got. Oh my gosh, I know the word has something to do with the vagina. It's a, it's a word. Of, it's, it's a female. It's got a. It's yes. It's a. It's to do with the vagina. It's the vagina, and I want to say it's like, um, well, Spaginus Street or." I don't know, like Volva Street or, oh my gosh, and I could not think of it. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, you're gonna have to look it up, but it's Westwood, somewhere along there. This is before there. cell phones, this is, you know. Yeah, 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 this is, you know. And and he's like, I go, you know, so I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't know where it is really, I guess. So, and anyway, we're back in the mor next morning, sitting in the makeup trailer again, and he looks at me and he starts laughing. And I'm like, what, what? And he goes, <laughs> he's like, I've been thinking about this. And laughing my ass up all morning. And I said, why? And he goes, you know the street that the Geffen is on? And I was like, what was it? And he goes, it's Le Conte Street. Le, Le Conte. <laughs> I was like, I knew it had something to do with the vagina. <laughs> we just lost all the kids. All right. So anyway. So, but but those are, I mean, and, and I remember like you would come back with stories like that and those are the epic stories and you talk about that in the book as well, you know, stories like that. Yeah. You, you also go into, I think it's chapter one is, is when you go to your manager and you end up and you, that's when you basically say you give up acting, you know, and it's an incredible yeah. chapter, very moving chapter, very powerful chapter, really vulnerable. But if you, it's not in the book, but can you talk about the moment when you said, I'm done? Is, was there one specific like moment where you're like you, you, either you came home or you you know the one instance where you're like oh my god I, I gotta quit um I don't know it was a long it was a long process but I remember you telling me there was one time where like this happened at a at a party <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty funny story. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrible story. No. Okay. <laughs> okay so um, I don't know. Nina might be there. I don't know. I don't know if Nina's listening. She might be. Oh, no. Sure. no. Well, maybe not tell. No. Okay. It is really funny. All right. It's funny. So I was, it was, <laughs> um, I was at a, um, we were, there, there was a time before it where I just, Acting had lost its sort of weight for me, but I didn't want it to. I really wanted to keep auditioning and stuff like that, but I was getting really pulled by the kids. And um, so sometimes I was blowing off auditions and stuff like that because I had plans with the kids and I don't know, it just, I wanted to do it, keep doing it, but I don't know what happened. I got, I felt like I, I went flaccid or something like that. It's a weird word. I just felt like I, just, I don't know, I just, I keep trying to find a better word for that. I just, I just was kind of getting a little, um, what's that word, when you're a little um, complacent, I was complacent. Anyway, so we were at, a, <laughs> I wish Nina was watching, this is a friend of mine, we were at her place and it was a big party and this man came up to me and I knew him, I really knew his face. And I was, he was like, hey Shannon. And I was like, hi. Oh my gosh, I know you, I know, I know you. And we're, I know we're so familiar. <laughs> and I'm like, it's because we're here and there's a whole lot of different people and I just can't place where I know you from. And he looks at me, he goes, I'm your agent. And <laughs> I was like, 
I was like, I know I knew you. I'm so sorry. Um, and then Nina gave me, my friend whose party was, she gave me so much like crap flat, about yeah. that. Yeah, flack about that. Yeah. And but that's, I mean, that's when Nestor says I knew and I, I should give up. I don't know if that was the exact moment. I don't know if it was, but I know at that point in time you were like, it's just like, it's time to give up. No, I never said no. I never, but it, I mean, I know no. you definitely, you were, you no, were. He just jokes around that that was the, maybe the time I knew. Yeah, anyway, but listen, um, you know, and as a result of that, you know, that choice, obviously, you, you've written this book, yeah. this incredible book where you bear your soul, you tell so many stories, uh, uh, we should give it up to, to whoever might have questions for you. Um, but anyway, thank you, Teresa, for allowing us to have a chat. And uh, yeah, thank if you. yeah, yeah, if there's any, any of questions course. anyone might have. <laughs> Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for letting us eavesdrop on your conversation. It feels like um, it's so much fun. Um, so, we, <laughs> so we've got um, quite a few questions from the audience. I want to make sure to get to um, the first one is from a surge and he's asking um, when you sat down to write the book for the first time, what was that like? Did you, did it flow out? Did you feel that you had to like write everything all at once or was it like pulling teeth? Well, I had journaled the whole time that I was in Hawaii. Um, a lot of friends gave me journals and when I left and it was like, well, I'm away for a whole year and, and relocating. So I knew I should journal and I did. And so it was really at the beginning sort of transcribing the journals and just remembering everything, excuse me. And then I didn't hit a flow immediately, but once I found my voice yet, yeah, it was just flowing out of me. But then I reached a point where I couldn't write anymore without a teacher. So I went to a memoir class at UCLA. So it was, I, I wrote and wrote and rewrote and tried to structure it, but I had never learned how to write other than writing a lot from my characters. I would do tons of backstory. And I'd done a lot of, a few theater pieces of my own that I'd written. So, so I wrote sort of methodically and then found a voice and then it flowed. Mm. So on a related note, um, this is a question from Amika who's asking, you know, you're a trained actor um, and you now have your voice as a writer. So how did your training and your voice as an actor inform your writing and your writing voice? Oh, it's so crossed over. It crossed over almost perfectly because it's, it's the same feeling when you find the voice of a character as to when you find your voice as a writer. This, for me, it was memoir. So it's my own voice I had to find. But as there's a point as an actor where you, you're working and working and working on a character and it feels like you're not there. And then there's like this drop and you think, oh, because you're using somebody else's words too as an actor and you you can feel it like you feel like oh i know i i'm in this character now and whatever your process is before that that's every actor is different but for me it was always writing i'd always write the backstory of my character so i had a really for me it was a powerful kind of brain pen gut connection that was always the way i found it and then i'd walk a lot with the lines but um so uh, that's always the way I worked through the pen. So, it, and then I'd have to obviously rehearse as an actor, but as a writer too, I found that, oh, I dropped into my real voice. So it was exactly the same feeling. It was, it's kind of amazing how for me, the two were, all, it's identical in that way. But technically there's a lot of differences obviously, but yeah, that important part of it, was very much mirrored the same thing to me. Mm -hmm. And so we've got this great question from Ray and Vero who say that they're reading the book together right now. And so far they're really hooked. Um, and they're asking, did Nestor collaborate at all or was it a surprise for him? Did he read the draft all at once at the end? Um, and how did your recollection of the event and his match or differ um, when you both sort of compared notes at the end? Well, you tell me what you I mean to me I yes I mean Shannon is an open book so and you have unfortunately you know, no no and I because I, I, I haven't always been that way and I've, I've become more so because of you and I think that's a, 
that's a good thing. That, that's that's a great thing. I mean, it's not an easy thing, you know, to 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 face the truth all the time, but but much better to do so and rip off the band-aid than to let it fester. You know, and it, so I've learned a lot from you on that. And I think that certainly helps your writing and, and your acting because you have a great truth meet, mm. you know, and so so you and even when you're you would question yourself, is that really how I felt? Is that really and and so you're like, no, like go deeper, go, go, go to the truth, go, you know, pretty or ugly, just go to that place. And that, which is why I think you're getting a lot of mail uh, from people saying, I so relate to this. I've just been too scared to articulate, you know? Yeah. And so I, I feel that very much so a lot of, a lot of, you know, what, what uh, you wrote is, is exactly as, as we experienced it. I didn't know the depths and, and the intricacies of the pain. I mean, I knew, you know, obviously the pain, but I didn't know it the way you've written it. And you write it in such a detailed and beautiful way, an heartbreaking way, and funny. I mean, it's really funny. There's just there's so much humor. It's just who you are. Um, but it's it's relatable. It's deep. It's it's specific. So I didn't know all of those specificities. And uh, but in terms of the broad strokes, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I it is exactly what we experienced. And then. Uh, how how did you read it? I often gave it to Nestor. Yeah. Always first. Yeah. Um, always finished. Yeah. I would read it. Yeah, and 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 I would always either you know laugh or cry or both. You know, at the oh, end of yes, it, would. a lot. That was great because it was a lot of it was was I was reading first the journal. You know, I would read a journal uh, entry and I'd be like, oh my God, this is raw. This just happened. I don't think I ever read the journal. Every once in a while, I would read a journal entry. You, you would write, you know, in Hawaii. But when I would read the chapter. Oh, I think I did give you some in Hawaii, didn't I? Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. But then, and so then, but then obviously when I, when, when you finished a chapter, yes, then at that point I would, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I had a real gut punch, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the times when I read it. It took me back, you know, and, and I think that's hopefully why a lot of people and they have for what those who've read it are it's resonating with that because you're talking about something people don't dare to talk about you know and, and, and it is this sort of and people feel shame for feeling it and you're articulating it and saying look you know what love it or hate it this is what i felt this is what i went through so but i love that ray is reading it with his partner that is <laughs> awesome and i think it's a really valuable book for men and women to read because mm -hmm. I've, I've, we've spoken to a number of couples who said we we argue about this thing about loss of identity when you're giving up a career the kid and the spouse doesn't mm -hmm. the other spouse doesn't get it you know and this is gonna this is valuable uh, for us to read it and hear someone else's perspective on this articulated in such a specific way so that know that I'm I'm not you know as I, I'm not crazy here you know other other people feel this stuff this is a real thing it's just not something that people talk about yeah it's really that's because you know we you know the my um, publishers have been sort of reaching out to a lot of mom podcasts and things like that, but it really like marriage kind of podcasts would be really good. For them. I mean, would be really good for that book. You know, this book. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a valuable. Yeah. Uh, it's a valuable read for a man just as much as a woman. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is another related question, actually, to tailgate on that last thought. And this is from Jesse who's asking, um, what advice would you give someone who is faced with this decision of setting aside one of their dreams for another? For another dream, I wonder, um, or for kids? Maybe another dream or like you, um, maybe setting it aside for- um, They have to Like a responsibility, yeah. Their responsibility. Um, Yeah, well, if it's a responsibility that then they have to. Um, and if it's a responsibility that they really feel that like I did that, um, see for us too, you know, the industry moved out of town and um, Nestor was away a lot. So there was no way both of us could do it. And plus my pull was to the kids. I would, I would do it with a lot of, give yourself a lot of grace when you do it and give yourself all those like get ready for all those emotions and then find like if there's something really missing try to find whatever that thing is um reimagined 
right? So if you, if you if you were doing something that was creative, you have to find something reimagined creatively, or if it was something that was dealing with a lot of people, refind that somehow in your new situation. If if that's what it's going to be missing. Um, I think acknowledging it is such a big that's part. That's right. Bring it on in. That's what I say. You know, just to to ignore the feeling is to, is to just beat it up more and beat that person inside of you that you promised something that you couldn't give them. So I think just acknowledging it first, recognizing it, treating it kindly, and then you're right. I think what you said is great. Giving it grace and then and then finding some outlet for that 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 person you promised inside you something. You know, yeah. some other outlet. And it's so hard because we've just been, obviously we're still going through this pandemic and a shutdown. And a lot of people have to have to give up stuff. Yeah, so it's not just kids. It's not just, you know, a, you know or, or giving up, you know, it's you, you, many people haven't had a choice. On top of, you know, enduring unspeakable tragedy, they've been laid off, they've lost their businesses, they've, they've had to be forced to reinvent themselves. So, so yeah, this is, you know, I think you have to acknowledge that loss for sure, you know, and find a way to while you regroup and tackle on another dream to make sure you you you, you, you heal that 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 wound inside you because I, I think we tend to move on and and, and neglect that and then yeah. and then it comes back and it hurts us you know if we, if we don't tend to it somehow and don't don't trust the people who say should yeah you should be grateful you should be you should get over it you know you are allowed to be with your kids your kids are the most important thing. how you should not be feeling this it's, everything's different you know for everybody so i sort of think like be give you give your feelings a lot of uh, uh, uh honor them and bring them on in let them in and then just you know sort of figure them out from there because there are you know that that can happen so i don't want to ever get in the mommy wars in my book like i feel like it it, it all works out for moms and kids, no matter what choice you make. And and I think I've now, because of my kids are in college, my older son, I've seen that happen. I've seen it. I've seen these kids grow up with all kinds of moms. And they're- Moms who work full-time. Yeah. Moms who work part-time, moms who are full-time moms. They all, I mean, really, I mean, I don't know the real ins and outs of these children. Not I'm not meant to. I, I mean, they all have stuff, of course. and. And, but you know they're all functioning really well in the world, and from what I can see, they're pretty delightful, most of them that I know. So it's just you know, it, it'll work, I think. Whatever you do, I sometimes I I mean somebody asked me this the other day on a podcast, and I did say to them, I think though if you really love what you're doing, and you know if you step away and you cannot get back in, I would think about that really long and hard. If you can't get back in, be careful about stepping out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're actually coming to the end of our hour. I found one question that I think will be perfect to close this out. Um, so it's from Daisy who says, Shannon, I will never get tired of hearing you talk about your powerful story in such an open way. Um, it's so beautiful and inspiring. Um, and she's asking, do you have any advice for those who want to start writing, but don't feel quite confident enough to start? Oh my gosh, yes, because I I really truly believe, and this is from a teacher I had in this, I just signed up for a memoir class, thanks to a friend of mine um, at UCLA. And- Let me tell Daisy her name, because she may be, work, be able to work with her online. Okay. Jenny. Wow, Jenny Nash. Yes, Jenny Nash um, at Author Accelerator. She's incredible. Well, she was teaching a memoir class, but now she runs a great book coaching business. And I'm so big on learning. So what she really taught us in this great memoir class, which was just, you could write a memoir about the memoir class because it was LA, so full of characters. And um, is that everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. Um, you can learn to write, it's, it's, it's a skill, right? You can learn. But you, what you have to do is write to find your own voice. So just you start, just start, just start writing. And it doesn't matter what form it's in. And then when you feel like you need help as, with a teacher, 
find one, they're everywhere. And Jenny Nash is incredible. Um, and, and then you'll learn all the, you know, just the things that you need to learn, like going to school when you learn how to, I don't know, do math or whatever. And, but your story can only be told because it's only yours and there's only your voice. Any story that you tell, you know, be it a novel or your own story. But I really, I really believe that because I saw it happen in this class. I just saw it. Everyone had their own story, somewhat common stories, right? But when you tell it from your point of view, then it's, it becomes its own thing and it's really powerful. Like my story, I felt like, oh my gosh, is this even going to be a story? Because nobody's dying, you know, um, I didn't have cancer. You Don't know, ruin like, book. Well, <laughs> Oh, well, actually, yeah. No. It might die some No, no well, but, but stuff like that, you know, but it doesn't matter. You could write, there's a great book out. Oh my gosh, it was called, I think it's called The Little Life of Ruthie Lemon. I think that's what it's called. And I might be wrong, but it's a, just a book that a brother wrote about his sister, his sister's life. And I just her life in her little town and and going to the library and all the little things she did. I can't, I don't remember the exact details. But it became this huge book because he did it out of his his point of view of his sister's little life. And and it and the idea is brilliant. And and it, just because it was his voice. So that's all you need to do, just start writing. Just put a pen to paper. I trust your voice. Yeah. yeah. That's, and so Daisy, that's what you need to do. Just start it, just start scribbling, do anything, anything. And just do a little bit every day. I could only write an hour a day for the first like six years, I think. It took me a long time to write this book. Mm. The kids were so little. Well, so an enormous thank you to you both, um, Nesta Carbonell and Shannon Kenny Carbonell. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your energy and your insight with us tonight. Um, before we do say goodbye, I wanna one mention one more time that if you would like a signed copy of All Is Not Lost, you can go to chevalisbooks.com or just click the link that I've dropped into the chat box and we will make sure that you get your signed copy. Uh, and so Shannon and Nestor, again, thank you. Uh, before we say goodbye officially, do either of you have any last words for us? Okay, I'm gonna just remember. Jenny Nash at Author Accelerator. And it's spoke with an A, Accelerator. If you want to write a book, look her up. She's great. She's got a lot of, um, a, a lot of, um, she trains a lot of people now um, in book coaching. Jenny, J E N N I E N A S N A S H, Jenny Nash. Yeah. She's awesome. I, we, I just want to say thank you oh, thank for, you for, so for hosting uh, this event. Uh, Teresa for Chevaliers, uh, and for everyone who joined us, thank you so much. Yes, and thank you. and uh, I'm sure we'll do, so much. you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have others, you know, that will be able to answer yeah. more questions. We'll be able to answer more questions. But uh, but this is so special, and this is uh, that your 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 store means so much to yes, us. Yes, thank you. And check out Chevaliers now that um, I never said it right. Chevaliers. How do you say it? Chevaliers. Chevaliers. <laughs> <laughs> the store looks amazing, and everyone should go check it out now that you can. Yeah. It's such a great um, story. Okay, and thank you both. Um, we hope everyone who joined us tonight has a great rest of your evening and make sure to get this book. Thank All right, you. everyone, good night. Thank All you right, both. Guys, thank you. Bye. Take care.